<laughs> Hello, Hello folks, folks. And, and thanks for tuning in to the Shaggy Lola Salami Show. I'm your host, Shaggy Lola Salami, and you're welcome to the Virtual Cafe. Um, what can I get you, please? Hello. This is Janice. Hi. Hi this is Janice Hoffman. Hi, How Janice. Are you? I'm fine. Thanks. Yourself? I'm, I'm excellent. I'm excellent. Welcome. Yes. What can I get you? Well, I would like to, you know what? Can we start fresh? Can we start over? Because <laughs> I forgot We're what I was <laughs> I was like, oh darn, I don't know what I was going to say here. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll edit it. Okay. Okay. And what am I supposed to say um, when I order? I mean, what was the prompt? You're supposed to introduce yourself, say what you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. You say your bio. So when you say, what do you want to order, just to start talking about myself? Yeah, you'd be like, oh, hi, um, I'm, I'm Janice, because I've introduced myself, so you'd be like, oh, I'm Janice, okay. I da, 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 da. Okay. Is that your phone? Yeah, I'll turn it off. I just turned it off. Sorry. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> okay, can we, okay. I'm ready then. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put on my editing skills. Um, okay. Da, 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 da. Hi, and welcome to the Virtual Cafe. I'm your host, Jagulala Salami. Um, here's next, please. What can I get you? Hi, this is Janice Hoffman, and I am an author and a non-denominational minister and uh, do, so I kind of have two careers. I have a, a book called Relationship Rules, 12 Strategies for Creating a Love That Lasts, and I have another book coming out this year, actually, called Love Rules, 50 Strategies for Navigating Love and Life, and as fate and the universe would have it, I have a dual career as a non-denominational minister and how that has shown up in the world lately, and prim primarily is um, I officiate memorial services for people and work with various mortuaries here in the Colorado, Denver area. Oh, so, wow, that's yeah. interesting. See, now, no, nobody odd would career, ever, but yeah, no one would ever think, you know, author, author minister. <laughs> I know. It really, you know, it really uh, raises eyebrows, for sure. And it wasn't like I planned to be either. You know, I was just doing my life, having kids, being a housewife, and ended up uh, Winner from Mars, Winner from Venus. The book came out, and I was had a meditation group, and I had a Course in Miracles group, and I had an Attitude and Healing group, and I thought I'll start a Mars Venus support group. So it'd be perfect. The book was bigger than anything we've ever seen since then, back in the '90s, and you know, never expected to end up working with the author John Gray ended up working for him and working on being on his staff and being um, part of the Mars Venus Institute, which taught to uh, train facilitators and counselors to teach the Mars Venus principles to people through workshops based on John Gray's various books. And mm -hmm. so my career just totally took off in the relationship field and got ordained in 99 just because I wanted to for myself. And um, a friend of mine, committed suicide in 08 and I went to his memorial service and the minister was so, in my opinion, um, bad that I got under my skin so badly that I went to the mortuary and said, hey, I can do a better job than that guy. And oh, that has wow. blossomed into this, you know, other career of meeting with families, writing services and officiating services and, you know, learning a lot about the other side and what happens to us after we die. Wow. You know, just through experience. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty wild. If people are always at their service, if you ever there's ever any doubt in your mind, they're always there because they always do something to let you know they're there if you look close enough. Interesting. Yeah. Sometimes hi, it's guys. obvious, sometimes it's subtle, but they're always there. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi, 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 Tara. Welcome. <laughs> oh, oh, hi. Difficulty. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's fine. Um, Janice, what would you like to drink today? Well, you know, I'm a I'm a Starbucks chai girl, kind of addicted. A little plug there for, for Starbucks, but um, yeah. Best part of my whole day sometimes is to, when I sip on my Starbucks chai. Okay. But um, for today, I think you know one of the things I think would be good to talk about as an author is the idea of reverse shoplifting. Okay. Yeah. Just give us a second. Um, let's get um. Tara's order. Hi, Tara. Hello. <laughs> oh, crazy. I, you know, I would love 
a chamomile tea right about now. So you I are. That's my favorite. I know. I was just going to say you're a chamomile tea junkie. You just have it I all am. the time. Yeah, it gets pretty ugly. When I don't have it, I'm like, okay, what's going on here? I will. I would love a chamomile with cream. Okay, we'll, we'll send the little human um, off to it. She's got her mouth full. Today oh, we're having a heat wave in London. It is the most glorious day. It is just one of those days where it feels like the sun is caressing your skin. You know, you just feel the heat just touching your skin and you're like, whoa, this is <laughs> nice. And I know you guys would not appreciate what I'm saying, but if you live in London, you will appreciate it. It's like when you live somewhere where you don't get a lot of good sunshine all the time and then the sun comes out and it's not even the sun that plays hide and seek with you but the sun comes out to stay and it's like, you know what? I'm going to come out today and I'm going to stay. I'm going to play with you guys. You appreciate <laughs> the sun. <laughs> I can imagine. I uh, can imagine. Yes, um, and then as I told you yesterday when we, we chatted, and everyone I'm sure probably, I guess the regular listeners will know that uh, Tara loves the, the, the virtual cafe, so this is like, what, your third time coming here now? Or your it is, time? it's my, it was, it's third time's a charm. <laughs> I, I hope it's not my last. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I'm a little late to the party, but, but it's, it's good to be here again on your show. I love your show. Thank you very much. Um, so Tara, yes, yeah, so I was speaking to Tara yesterday, um, and I said to her, I turned 21. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sort of, somewhat, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned 21. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was my birthday yesterday, and it was sad, and then I made... And I think I shouldn't make my own birthday cake, but then my little human, she's only one, so she can't really make my little my cakes for me. So I, I did the cake myself, and I thought it was the most delicious one. Even though I'm biased and I made it myself, but I actually thought it was really good. Uh, it was like beautiful. Thank you. It was, oh, it's it like it was really man, unfair you of you to send me a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, it was gorgeous though. It looked like a bakery shop cake. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying. Um, so what, what, how did I do? So it was like an Oreo cake. Um, so the main cake itself was a nice 8-inch full, full-bodied um, Oreo cake. And then for some reason, right, when I bake my cake, I don't add any baking powder to it because I just think baking powder is an unnecessary ingredient. And my cake seems to always rise. Like, my niece was asking me, it's like, Auntie, how come you don't put baking powder but in your cake rice? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, you know, so it's like this full cake. And then if you see the top in the picture, right, you see that it's almost got like an umbrella shape because it kept right. rising. And it, it was almost like it was going to chip, chip over. And I'm like, why well, haven't put any baking powder? Why does this thing keep rising well, and rising? What kind, of flour, what kind of flour do you use? Do you use all-purpose or self-rising? That's like just plain, plain, regular, I think it's all-purpose flour. It's just plain. I don't. I don't use the sulfur because I try to. I think about the ingredients that I add to stuff. I just think, right? Well, if it's uh, the sulfurated, it's got all these things that you know is not naturally found in the thing. So I'm like, what is? What is the purpose of it? The, the exactly. Yeast, yeah. The yeast is not in enough. So there's. Well, I, I think you know what we're gonna have with our with our drink orders, then, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that's only fair. <laughs> yes. Jason, we're going to have birthday cake. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good to me. <laughs> would, would you believe this, right? There's only a quarter left of that cake. Oh, no, no, that's fine. We'll, we'll just take that and divide it amongst the two of us. I, <laughs> I hear you trying to, to, to get a good excuse, but we're, I think we'll have some cake. <laughs> oh, 15 minutes late and she's demanding cake. Yeah, that's yeah. how I roll. <laughs> That's right. Oh yes, and I didn't finish describing the cake. So for the people who are just listening, so yeah, so it was a nice eight-inch, really full Oreo cake that didn't have any baking powder in it, but seemed to want to spill out of the pan. Um, so the top of it sort of has like a, a expanded. It's not a nice cylindrical one. The top seemed to want to almost expand. Um, and then I did, you know, I did a fresh cream, fresh whipped cream, and then I had crushed Maltesers. To put it as the foundation, so that when I put the cream and then I put the other cake, it then balances out, you know, really nicely. Uh, and then I did a cream and chocolate, um, is it frosting, icing, coating all over it. 
Um, and then I put more oh, more teasers boy. on it. Mm. There, that, 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 was, that was the case. I'll be over. Yes! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Not for the sunshine. We want to... Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think it'll take me longer to go through uh, security than it will to fly. Isn't that the case? Isn't oh, that yeah. Ridiculous? It's three and a half and hours in Denver right now. They're, they're telling you. Yeah, three that's hours. Crazy. You know what? I think they're doing it on purpose because it never used to be this. We used to have holidays and everything. We never used to have this. Ever, 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 ever. Exactly. And, I mean, suddenly, the suddenly there's short TSA employees who don't do hardly anything but stand there anyways. <laughs> and take my lotion and confiscate and, my and, lotion. Well, did you hear what they were doing to help to help ease the stress of people standing in line? They brought. I'm not kidding you. They brought in clowns. What? They had money. To buy, to pay for, for clowns, like real clowns from circuses. I'm not kidding. This is not a joke. To bring, come in and, and like talk to the people standing in line to go through securities to relieve their stress. <laughs> it's I Colorado. Even... If you're going to bring in something to relieve stress, bring in marijuana. I mean, you know, <laughs> forget the clowns. Kids are afraid of clowns. I mean, I'm not. Now I'm being sarcastic, but I mean, are you kidding? That's, That's like such a slap in the face. Who likes clowns, really? No, no. How many pictures of clowns do you have in your house? None, no, it's right? No, I'm not liking clowns. They terrify me. Exactly. Exactly. And if you go to the Denver airport, you'll see all kinds of terrifying things on the walls that nobody talks about. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, That's a whole other subject. Threat if they send a clown to, to entertain me in the... <laughs> you know, you have to look at the message behind the action, you know, like, okay, people f don't like clowns, they find them terrifying, you're wasting yes. money that you could be spending on more TSA employees, but apparently it takes three months to get one in there, and, well, and, and, and you're supposed, this is supposed to be funny to you? I mean, it's just a slap in the face to the people no in there, intended, my opinion. But I'm changing the whole topic here, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, don't oh, get me started on DIA. Story. I could go on for an hour, but <laughs> yeah. there's, something terror, there's something very wrong about that place. That's all I have to say. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, that's that's why. Right. Something but very, very, very fishy. Let's it, put it, it this way: when I go there, I smell fish. Okay, that's all. <laughs> I was, what? It just is fishy to me all the time. You know, there's just so many fishy things about that place that it's hard to right. believe that it's just a uh, airport. Yeah. Do you fly often? No, uh, you know, I flew when it was nice to fly, and there was no right. TSA, and there was no Homeland Security, and it was it was enjoyable. And now it's it's miserable. Mm -hmm. You know, they they it's make the ordeal. flying ex they take everything they they do everything they can to take all the joy out of flying now. Oh I just don't enjoy it. I, I mean, I still fly, but not as much as I used to. And, and I'm kind of glad like, I, fl I flew when it was nicer. Yeah. yeah. Do you like talking about books, though? Because if flying is not good, then hopefully talking about books would, would put a nicer taste in your mouth. Yeah, well, you know, when people fly, that's what they do. They get their books out and their headphones. And so books are, you know, books are a really big deal. In fact, Dad, I was just talking. Go ahead. You have to leave some copies of your book in the little pockets behind the seats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you want to hear something? I have done that. My daughter works in in Hollywood. She works on film crews. She's a camera person, and I tell her all the time, you know, just when you go to work every day, just drop one of my books on the floor somewhere. Right. <laughs> Somebody will pick it up. You know, and if you do I, that every I, day, that. <laughs> yeah, and she, if you do that every day, sooner or later, somebody important will pick it up, and you know, maybe you know, it's worth the investment. Yeah, yes. actually, that's, that's actually yeah. a very good point because that was the other thing that I was going to ask you, you know, when, when we, we were talking before. I read this article, um, and it's about reverse shoplifting, okay? And so I then wrote about it on my blog, and because I've got baby brain, that's my excuse, and I'm going to stick with it. Um, I, I have to now go onto my blog to actually read what it says, right? Because I can't remember all of it. So basically, <laughs> right, I'm going to read word for word, right? So now go. What do you think of reverse shoplifting? As someone who is not from a marketing background, but you know I'm determined to make uh, a success of being an author, I spend a considerable amount of my time researching innovative marketing strategies. It was on one such occasion that I came upon a most brilliant strategy. Well, maybe not so brilliant. You might even call it foolish. I guess because it depends on which perspective you're looking at it from. 
it re you know, it involves shoplifting. What? Like, okay. Seriously, let me just put a disclaimer, right? If you do go and shoplift, they will put you in jail, and you cannot say you heard it from the Shaggy Lola Salami show that shoplifting is a good marketing strategy. That is not what I said, right? So regular shoplifting, you know, is when you go into a store, <clears throat> and just for the purpose of the show, I'll say you go into a bookstore, you take a book, uh, you put it in your jacket, you look left, you look right, no one's looking, and then you walk back out, right? Now, that is very wrong thing to do, and it's illegal, and if you're caught, you'll be sent to jail, right? Now, this now brings me to the question of this most brilliant or most foolish strategy. Is it illegal if you do the opposite, right? So, by opposite, I mean you walk into a store sneakily, you have a brand new book, and you add it to the shop, you know, into the shelves. What do you think of that? You know, because that's, you know, that's shoplifting in reverse. So instead of you taking a book out of the store, you're taking a book, you're putting a book into the store. Mm. You know, two I actually... Two thumbs down. Two thumbs down. You know, I've actually heard of this, but never knew that it had a name. Because mm. when my, my book, Relationship Rules, came out in 07, you know, it took all kinds of marketing and promotion and all that kind of stuff for books. And um, this was actually one of the uh, techniques, tactics that they promoted. Oh and really? The person, yeah, and the person promoting it, you know, she's very, very um, well known, and she's known in Colorado as a book shepherd, and has a, a author meetup group, and has her own organization called Author You, and and she would, yeah, and I and not just her, but I've heard other people in the industry talk about this as a way to you know get your book out there, because they'll take it to the register, they'll scan it, it won't be in the system, you know, it just brings a bunch of attention to your book, without having to do much of anything. Actually, quick, just cut in there, right? Um, this, um, when I was looking at this strategy, what the guy said was that if a book has a valid barcode, if you take it to the register, or like here we say if you take it to the till, it will scan. As long as it's got a barcode, it will no, scan. No, it will scan. I mean, it will scan, it, you know, it has a price associated with it, yeah. you know, from the wholesaler or distributor. But yes. it won't show up in their internal computer system. In other words, it's not a part of their catalog or what they can. Right. But it'll scan as far as a price. But they'll be confused as to why the product page is an in-house. Right. You know, yeah. Barnes and Noble has their own in-house. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, when my book came out, I had uh, just a horrible, horrible, horrible. In fact, I don't even know if it's in there anymore. I, I've given up. A uh, horrible time trying to keep my book in their system. It just evaporates every every time I get it in their system, That's and nice. and it's just too much stress to keep trying over and over. What retailer would this be? Barnes and Noble. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. I, I don't know what it is about my book and and their system, but they don't jive very well. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's interesting what you said, Tara, because this is what in it was in an, uh, a Huffington Post article that I read. Um, and at the time, it, he was a newbie author. His name was Brendan Leonard. Um, you know, so this is what he said, right? And that I've, I'm just reading from my blog because I've got baby brain. Um, he says he felt, this is Brendan, that as a relative nobody beyond you know having a blog that gets over a million you know plus page v uh, views per year and a not so unique storyline, and of course no one reputable had you know published his book. He felt that his chances of getting his book into big shows was zero. <laughs> So he then had a brilliant, a genius strategy. He said, "I'm going to shove copies of my book onto the shelves at Barnes and Noble." <laughs> he told his friend, you know, and then he also said he was going to mail five copies, you know, or so to friends who would want to help him out. You know, apparently this was the same strategy that Russell Simmons had used in his book called Super Rich. According to the book, um, you know, friends of Russell Simmons had spent their life savings making a single uh, a single called Christmas Wrapping with a then unknown MC named Curtis Blow, um, and they helped asked Simmons to help them create a buzz for the record. <laughs> um, Simmons ran around New York um, handing out the the single to club DJs, begging them to play the song. And as the song began, you know, to build, as the buzz began to build. They started pressing new versions of the record with a fake order number for Polygram Records. Um, and as more and more DJs played the song and the hype grew even more, um, record stores began to call Polygram Records trying to order the songs. 
But obviously, this was a fake order number, and Polygram were confused. Well, you know, when they then eventually had enough calls, they figured out that, you know, you know, they just had to sign, you know, Curtis Blow, you know, a deal. Because, you know, if people were already calling them trying to get, you know, order a product for this guy that they had never heard about, then he just made more business sense, um, you know, for them to, to take him on. So this was the, you know, the strategy that Brendan Leonard wanted, you know, to, to, to follow. But then how would regular shop, uh, shoppers get the book out of the store? That was his conundrum, you know. So this is where he now said, uh, um, someone said to him that apparently as long as the book has a barcode printed on it, and as long as the book had an ISBN, it would scan, right? So Brendan had to then test this out. So what did he do? He snuck a copy into a shelf um, in a Flagstaff store, um, and then two hours later, his girlfriend picked up the copy, took it to the till, and was able to purchase it. Right. Well, you know, again, with with it having a barcode and, you know, an ISBN number, valid ISBN number, that's not really the, the shocking part because it will scan. Um, and, in, you know, and you're able to actually go through with the purchase. Hmm. Um, so, but, again, it's it's not inventoried, so to speak. It's not warehoused with that retailer. So that's what I don't understand because I've never really worked in that side of retail before. I mean, I've done retail when I was a teenager, but I never really looked at the inventory side of it. So how exactly does that work? Well, basically, um, let's just just let's just take Barnes and Nobles or let's say Walmart for example. Hmm. Uh, Walmart will order a shipment of books from the wholesaler, and that goes into their their tra their inventory tracking system, their software in their in their computer mm -hmm. system. And it's not store specific. It's it, it's Walmart. It's the entire chain. And mm -hmm. as as a unit is sold, the computer knows to uh, basically back order that exact you know that amount of of new books. So if five books are sold. The computer knows to order five more. It's automatic. It's kind of automatic. ah yes yes. So it's stock and, management. Exactly, and it would take a you know a person who's deciding well this book you know is not selling so let's not renew it. It's it's all numbers. If the book sells X amount of copies in X amount of time, then they label it as you know slow moving. It needs to go to the bargain bin and don't reorder. Or this book is really selling a lot of copies in a short amount of time. You know, make sure we keep it in stock. People obviously want to buy this book, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it's seasonal and rotational and all these other mm -hmm. factors that you know people who know more than I could talk, you know could tell you about. But it's very much in their computer system. So mm -hmm. a book that's not in their system, again, you can it will it will be. Um, it, it'll go through the registry. You can purchase it, but it's not in their system. They have no way to reorder it. or They basically don't know it exists, or it, they don't know it's in their store. Mm. I, I kind of have a problem with the Russell Simmons analogy. It's like a false equivalency. Um, right. It, it's, the way the setup is similar, but the execution is so different. I don't think you can really apply. I don't think you can apply it to books because – in the situation you described with the with the record, um, the demand came from consumers. In other words, you know, DJs and people in nightclubs. You're mm. talking about a packed nightclub full of people who are dancing to this album and liking it. And what mm. happens is they're calling the radio stations the next day to to request to hear the single. Mm. So and and the and the um, radio DJ they're like we don't we don't have that song we don't know about it well you need to get it so the demand was already there this wasn't trying to create demand the demand came from pe the patron the people who go to the nightclubs and okay. that's where that's where the fake imprint came in with the fake polygon imprint yeah. Um, it's a different animal as far as sneaking your stores into into retailers because those are just you know just a handful of individuals who um, will find your book, purchase it, and it they may you know it could be word of mouth or someone you know influential or important could get the book, but the chances of that happening are just are the same as if you you left the book you know almost anywhere else. Without this, without the problems that I think you could run into by sneaking your book into stores. So it's, one of those, 
it's one of those things that it sounds so great at first. It's like people who got married in the 80s. The blue eyeshadow really felt like a good move. <laughs> but looking back, you're like, should I have thought that through a little better? <laughs> I, I think I just, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to cut corners. Yeah, what sort of problems do you think someone would go go into uh, would get into? Um... Well, well, they're they're kind of you know they feel they sound like minor problems, but to me, I think it's enough to make me not do it. Um, for example, one problem is it's it's not really honest because those the publishers and you know the the wholesalers they have um, a shelving fee. Most bookstores have a shelving fee that publishers or wholesalers have to pay to get it's a it's a small fee but they do pay it to get their books um, is this just the big store or the small stores um i i would i know for sure small stores in fact my local bookstore has a $25 per book shelving fee okay. and the larger stores they the chains may have it also um but but there's that and that that's not being paid um, the, the employees that work in the store, they have to do, you know, extra, it's not much, but over, if everybody, if this idea caught on and everyone did it, just think of how many books that don't belong in the store are on the shelves, you know, in the bins, on the floor, wherever they happen to end up. And that's more work for people who aren't going to be paid more to have to deal with, with more work. And eventually what happens is, you know, retailers begin to catch on. And they're like, wait a minute. So then they're keeping an eye out for people like can us me? who are sneaking in our books. And I can. And that, that's not good for, you know, indies already suffer a bit, our reputation, you know, as legitimate quote unquote um, authors. And I don't, I don't think that would help that situation if we get the reputation of, of trying to sneak our books into stores. Um, it just seems... Again, it seems like a, a good idea, but we just have to work that much harder to to get our books out there, to get our message out there. And I love uh, Janice's idea of leaving books, you know, here and there, leaving them in, you know, restaurants, on tables, on park benches. Yeah. To me, that feels a little more organic. Um, yeah. Because you're not trying to deceive anyone, I think. Yes. And also, some, um, you know, quality control is is an issue within you know the, the indie community and, and some indie authors aren't as diligent with you know their 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 editing and their, mm -hmm. their proofreading and their conceptualization as you know as we as we like it to be so for every you know wonderful book for every great book that's out there by an indie there's going to be about eight or nine that are not as well developed but we're all lumped into the same category and when these books that, that probably don't have as, as good of a quality content as you'd like, when they make it onto bookshelves at Barnes and Nobles, etc., it's only a matter of time before and they're just not going to stand for it. And then those of us who may have had a chance with our, with our better products, again, we're kind of lumped into the same category. So I don't know. It just doesn't feel like a good direction to go in for me. I think it's better to put your books in the hands of, of readers in a more upfront way, I think I would say. Mm -hmm. So I guess where you're coming at is more from an ethical um, point of view. Right. I, yes, I, I would agree. And also, again, just eventually, like I said, if more, if more people catch on to this and start doing it, it's only a matter of time before you actually have retailers who are on the lookout for us. To, and, mm. we, and then instead of being, you know, potential partners, we become, we become targets. Mm. Um, and, our, and I think our reputation suffers. Yes, yes, yes. No, that, that makes sense. Someone sent me a message on, on Twitter um, when I posted the article. And, you know, you're quite right. And she said something that there's a lot of extra work for the staff. Um, and, you know, there is the whole inventory thing, which I never really understood uh, because it's free money. Um, you know, when Brendan had done the, you know, the test um, when he did it, you know, he said that, you know, the, the, the book, his girlfriend was able to buy, you know, and pay for it. Um, so that was 
quite interesting to me that you know the store was able to take money that wasn't on their system because they did take the money they didn't turn the person around and say oh no this is not on our this is not on our on our system so we're not going right. to take this you know they they gladly right. took the money and that's why I thought is that a most is that a foolish thing to do or was that a brilliant thing to do because you get you're getting a, you're giving a multinational company more money because you should think I about think that's... Hmm. sorry go ahead no go on no go on finish. I, I think that's money better spent on 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 legitimate marketing and and promotional material. Honestly. Hmm. Mm. Okay. I'm just gonna see because um, Jana seems to be having uh, <clears throat> some problems. So let me just send her a quick message because she said. Um, can you give me a second. Okay. Every single time, you know, technology always um, seems to. Um, it's not a technology day today, is it? <laughs> no, <laughs> it seems like almost every Friday now is a not is a not technology um, um, day because Janice, you know, what she was saying earlier on, you know, she seemed to think that you know the coach that she had, you know, employed the same strategy for her, um, and it worked. Um, and I'm quite curious to know what she thinks about. Um, what you've said so far, but she's here, I can hear her, but she can't seem to hear us, which is really sad. Um, Janice, can you hear me now? Hey there, can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, can you. See, I can see uh, Tara's face. Yeah. react to my voice, so I'm assuming you can hear me. Hi, Tara. Hi, we can hear you, yes. I can kind of read your lips. I wish you guys could hear me. I wish I could, I wish I could hear you. Right. Um, so a little bit I can say about reverse shoplifting that I was saying before was um, this was a marketing tactic that we were taught in marketing our books and doing PR for our books. Um, nobody really ever looked at it negatively. So... Unfortunately, since I can't hear what you're saying, I'm not sure how um, what you what your perceptions are on whether it's a negative thing to do or a positive thing to do. I think I did it once with just one of my books. Um, you know, going in with half a dozen might be a little bit different deal. And now they have cameras everywhere, so um, I don't know. I don't know if I would do it now. I did it back in 07, but I don't know if I would do it now. Right. I, you know, I, I would as a, I think as a, as not only an author but as a person, I would feel better leaving it. You know, like I said, on park benches, um, take them to homeless shelters, take them to battered women's shelters, take them to group homes, orphanages, uh, leave them at the doctor, the dentist, uh, because those are people who probably would be very happy to, to you know to receive free reading material, and. You know, just knowing that they're going to enjoy it, even, you know, without the word of mouth, which if it's, you know, really good, that usually happens anyway. I think I would feel much better doing something like, like that and hoping, you know, to get some uh, some buzz about my, my work, I think, in that way. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, well, I don't think... Um... I don't think that was Brendan's um, plan, though, because I think what he, what his motivation, um, and this is me just jumping on a limb and trying to say, because again, I, I don't know um, what was going through his mind. Mm -hmm. um, his motivation was to try and see if enough people ordered the book from the store, will that make will that motivate the store to want to stock it? So that was what I think. Again, I'm not a mind reader, and I have to put this disclaimer for him to not sue me and go, "Oh, you're putting no, words I, in my." I would agree. No, I would. I would agree with, with that mm -hmm. assessment. I, I think that's definitely, you know, uh, what he was uh, trying to do. And and again, there's a chance that 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 could could work. I mean, if you've got, you know, ten people coming to the register with this with this book, and they're like, "Well, this book is selling pretty well. Why don't we carry it?" That, that exactly. Could, that could bleed over you know, into them contacting the author and requesting more. Um, exactly. But I'm just, I, I'm just I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm not comfortable with, with that kind of tactic um, because 
again, or they could be annoyed. I mean, because the, the, the few dollars that they, that they make by ordering the book from the author say, okay, they, this book is selling well, let's order the book. I'm not sure that they wouldn't also be a little annoyed that someone kind of got over on them. I don't know. Sometimes our, our ego can, can, tr can trump, I guess what would be a, a business decision. I don't know if they mm. would want to set that precedent or I, I don't know. You know, it, it's a good question. I, it's not something that I think is, is, has a straightforward, like, I think you could land on either side of the line and probably feel okay about it. This mm. is just my personal, you know, uh, thought, you know, thought on it, but I, I guess I could see that, that that could happen. I think the chances are slim, but it could happen. Mm, mm. It could happen. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So reverse shoplifting now. So the general consensus from our guest today is don't do it. The lovely Tara seems to think of it as uh, coming from an ethical point of view, because one, you know, the, the store might not look at you very favorably, you know, because people don't seem to like indie authors and self-published authors anyway. So if you're then trying to be sneaky, then, you know, it's possibly um, going to be putting in the authors in, in a bad light because they're going to be like, oh gosh, look at you all trying all these sneaky um, tactics. So then that's potentially one, one negative for, for doing that. Um, there, there is definitely that small potential that, you know, it might drum of interest because obviously people are already in the bookshop to buy stuff and then they might be looking along amongst the category that they're interested in and they might just stumble upon your book and maybe if the cover image um, takes their fancy they might think oh, okay this looks interesting enough let me let me just you know let me get it and so they go to the you know stuff but then I think also because I had it on Twitter one um, I don't know if it was an author but it was a lady um, who worked who worked in retail or has worked in retail and she was vehemently against it you know her her reason was that you're giving extra work to the staff, you know, who are already, you know, who already have so much more, you know, a lot to do without them adding to their workload that they're then not being paid to do. Because like you said earlier on, you know, if every indie author was doing that, then the store is going to be inundated with all these extra books that they probably have to get rid of, um, you know, because it's not part of the store's um plan and then obviously that's also not going to be good for the trees because if, we, if they end up having to chuck away those books they're probably just going to end up in the bin somewhere or if the store is nice it will be recycling but then if they have to recycle then they've possibly got to pay um for the cost of um the recycle um, right. yeah hmm. yeah Interesting. Now, I will give you something though. So, instead of doing that, now see for me, I'm a big advocate for asking. You know, my mom used to say, if you don't ask, you don't get. You want something, you ask. Right? Now, I like bacon. Right? Yeah. And I am shameless. Okay? I will always put it, my hands up and say, I am shameless. <laughs> Okay, so I went so down the road from where I live. Um, you know, I'm quite interested in hydroponics. You know, if I had, you know, if I had a big piece of land, right, I would actually like to get an aquaponics system. And so, aquaponics is so the one I have in my head, yeah, that I salivate over in my mind is to have a nice pool, not pool, a uh, pond. Then I'm going to have ducks, I'm going to have tilapia, and then I'm going to have like a chicken coop. And then, you know, have a little greenhouse all, con you know, um, connected together to find, you know, to make this nice, cool uh, aquaponics closed system. Uh, so when I was, when I moved to mm. where I live in now, I saw an, a, a hydroponics store. Uh, Janice, can you hear us? Finally, yes. I'm back. Yes. Hi, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just, yes, nice, to, nice for you to be able to hear us again. Uh, can you so hear I've, us? Hello? Mm. Janice? Okay. Okay, no, that's fine. Okay, can you so hear us, Janice? Pardon me? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear both of you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. I just had to awesome. restart my brand new computer, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> so 
that's right. So what I was saying to Tara um, was that I'm shameless, that this is a strategy that Happy I think... Friday. <laughs> well, at least it's not Friday the 13th. You shouldn't have seen the problems that I had on Friday Jamila, the 13th. are you there now? <laughs> can you hear me? I think I we can... lost Shagilala. Can you hear me? Wait for a second. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? You're not talking to me, are you? I'm just saying hello. Can I, you guys I think hear me? We lost our host. Hello? Can you guys really well, not well, hear Janice, me? I, I think that um, while you were ironing out your technical difficulties, we, we didn't really get a chance to to discuss your 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 total view on uh, on reverse shoplifting for indie authors. Sir, can you, guys hear me? you can hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, um, you know, I, I'm kind of a mixed bag on this one because I don't know how much trouble you can get into and like I was saying before, um, you know, they have cameras and that sort of thing. Right. So I don't know how much they frown on this, but you know, I know as an independent author myself, um, Without a distributor and without a big name publisher, you can't get on the end caps. You can't get into the big house, you know, Costco and the big, the big box stores. And so it is a much diff more difficult road to toe as an independent author. But you know, we have to do what we have to do. I mean, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, so it's just not like they don't know that people do that. I mean, I'm sure they're aware <laughs> of it. You know, she was discussing. Um, you potentially what what the, the the subject of the article she read um, he, what he was attempting to do uh, was to, to to you know have enough people to purchase quote purchase the book to the point that the retailer would say okay well why right. are we carrying this guy why are we carrying this book so you do you see that as a, a definite I, mean, I see it as a plus but it's kind of like when you know when your book comes out you know, all your friends and all your family and all the people that said they wanted to copy, you know, once you get that wave, then then where does the next wave come from? So, you, you know, you can right. try this tactic and get a get a, a wave going of purchasing, people purchasing your book, but then once the wave is over, you're still back to reality. Right. You know, unless that wave creates another wave, which is the, you know, the hope, the goal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've created many waves and... and can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. I can what, hear you. What has, what can you hear me, Tara? Can you, that's, that's sorry, can you, ta can you hear me, Tara? Past, as far as, as getting the word out there about your book. Janice, can you, you know, hear me? I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Tara, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I can't hear her anymore, but I can hear you. Who can you hear, Tara? Janice, do you want to ask Tara who she can hear? Can she hear me? <laughs> Tara, could, can you hear? Can you hear? So Jan Janice, what do you what do you find what do you I don't find think she can hear you. best for you in, in the past? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I don't think she can hear you. Um, what's worked best for me has been actually just getting out there and talking with people, and and I do public speaking. I love speaking in front of an audience, and so mm -hmm. I think even if I don't talk about my book, even if I talk about you know something like funerals, um, people, they, I endear myself to people enough that they want to buy my book just because they got to know me. And so I think right, you know, getting right. to know the author, whether it's through like what she's doing through podcasts or getting out there and speaking or whatever way you can expose yourself to an audience of people who are interested in your topic, you know, and, and in that way you endear them to you, you know, people. Creating those personal relationships. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, you know, we live in such a fast, I want it now society that I don't know that people that are younger realize how many years it takes to build those relationships and, you know, they want it now or they want it in a year or, you know, sometimes it takes years for people to, exactly. um, you know, I started with John Gray back in 95, 96 and I'm still known as the Mars Venus lady. So it mm -hmm. gave me, you know, to stay with that and not change careers and, People, you know, now know me as the Mars Venus lady. Whether they ever bought from me, or whether they like John Gray, or the Mars Venus philosophy, or not, they still—that's my. Sorry, can I ask don't... this question, though? Who is John Gray? I've never heard of him before. Is oh that... my gosh! 
He's not quite Hope he's not listening. <laughs> John Gray is the author of all the Mars Venus books. So Men from Mars, Women from Venus, and Mars and Venus in the Bedroom, and Mars and Venus very, on a Date, and Mars and Venus Stopped. Yeah, he wrote many, many books. He's the best selling nonfiction. Men are from Mars, Women, from Venus, Women are from Venus is best selling nonfiction book next to the Bible. Wow. Still, in America, hard copy alone, he still sells 2,000 copies a day. That's unreal. It That's is unreal because I have a teen dating program in high schools called Get Smart Dating that I've done for 20 years. And kids, you know, they always had heard of the book or they heard the phrase or Mars, Venus, something. You know, they were familiar with some aspect of it. Hmm. And now I'll go in there and they've never even heard even the phrase. And it's Amazing. such a part of, of, of uh, American vernacular at this point. I know. I, right. I mean, at one point it had 97% um, name recognition across the board in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was you know we've just never seen a book like that. So when you when I try and explain to people the the you know the height and breadth of that book and how many people related to it and it was number one and number two in China and Iran. So it isn't an right. American you know thing. Mm -hmm. It it isn't cultural. It's you know it's how our bodies are designed. And it doesn't even matter what your religious belief or what country or what culture you come from. Men and women are different, and they women have innate emotional needs that are different from men's innate emotional needs, and how we process stress is very differently. And I get accused, and John gets accused all the time of stereotyping men and women. Mm. Yes, you have to stereotype to make a point, and that's what the topic is about. So that's like talking about cars and saying, well, all you do is talk about cars and saying, well, but that you brought up the subject of cars. <laughs> You know, I get, it's like that all the time. I remember in the back in the 90s, people, men especially, would say, do you really think men and women are that different? I'd say, I don't know. Drop your pants. Let's see. <laughs> you know, I got so tired of, you know, I got so tired of people saying that to me because obviously we're different. We have different anatomy. So to even say, do you really think we're different? It just seemed like an ignorant thing to say, and I got tired of hearing it, so I would just goof around and tell them to drop their pants. But, um, well, how... How were you able to, to take that that overarching theme and you know in what ways were you able to distill it down into your own your own distinct voice and your own particular take on 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 such a, a broad topic? How did yeah, you um, your own? That's really a good question because when I first joined, I was the very first person John Gray ever trained, and I thought I had to know everything he knew. So I watched every one of his videos and. You know, back then we had all we had were videos, and and wrote make just wrote down everything he said on a pad of paper, and then would just stop, and replay, and write, and stop, replay, and write. And I thought I'd had to know everything he had, he knew, and so I know a lot about <laughs> what he has come up with on the differences between men and women. And what I did with it was, um, I put it in a woman's pers you know, from a woman's point of view. You know, there were certain things he could say. And there are certain things he couldn't say. You know, him for him to talk about a woman and her hormones during her menstrual cycle would have been totally inappropriate, inappropriate for him to say. Mm. But I can, I can talk about it. <laughs> you know, and then he has this he has this thing where you know about proposing to somebody and getting on one knee, and it, the whole point is the difference between could you and would you. So when a man says, you know, would you marry me? He's it's a it's a call to uh, it's a it's a request, whereas if you say, could you marry me, it's a, you know, it's a question of ability. Exactly. And so when I did that one time, I, you know, did the whole thing, you know, could you marry me, I didn't get a laugh, you know, and there were just, I realized certain things he could say that, that went over really well that I couldn't say, but the flip side was there were a lot of things I could say he could never ever say. So it kind of balanced, it balanced. It really balanced it out, plus, you know, I kind of come from the point of view of with the whole differences between men and women, you know, because people think it's an interesting concept, but they don't think it as it's important enough to know in terms of how it would make a difference in their lives. They just think mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's an interesting. Mm -hmm. And so my whole take on why you would want to educate yourself on the differences between men and women is so that you don't take other people's actions and words personally. Okay. And it's every, coming I'm, from someplace, so it's easier to... Yeah, to when you know why somebody is behaving or why they say what they say in the way mm -hmm. that they say it, because we both use the English language, but we use it differently. Um, you know, if I know that I have a fight with my partner and I go to the bedroom to cool off and I walk out and he's sitting in the lazy way watching sports, eating Doritos and drinking a beer, <laughs> that that isn't a sign of how much he cares or doesn't care. 
I know he has an ability to disassociate. And so what he did was he disassociated from what was happening between him and I, and now he's mm -hmm. doing this other thing called watching TV, which I now know is how he relieves stress from an argument. And so I won't walk out of the bedroom and go, oh, so you can just watch TV and drink a beer and eat Doritos? Like, like what just happened was nothing? Which is <laughs> what like that's most women example. would react. Yeah, because that's, that's how, how else, because we would never do that. We, we're distraught. We're like calling our girlfriend, writing in our journal, trying to meditate, you know, a million different things, and, and they're out there look, seemingly enjoying themselves. So without okay. knowing that, I could take it really personally. And the thing about taking things personally is I'm going to change my behavior and how my attitude towards you if I take something you say or do personally. And that is going to take away from our time together. And so if I can eliminate taking things personally and not changing my behavior and attitude towards you, maybe even gossiping about you behind your back later, <laughs> multiple well, can, times. Can, can, yeah. Janice, can you, he can you hear Shagilala? I can. I can hear both of you. Okay, so I'm just, I'm not able to hear her. Oh, I see. Can, and I'm assuming she can hear me. I, so. Yes, I okay, can. This is, okay. Yeah, she can hear you. She can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you 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 kind of have to tell me when she says something. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> okay, because I can hear you just fine. Yeah, I had to turn my computer off and log in again and re right. reboot it and everything. So, um, I'll tell you if she says something. Do you have something you want to say? <laughs> no, it's just, it's just been it's just been amazing listening to uh, to both of you. Um, you know, it's kind of like you know, I'll just sit back and let you guys just continue because you know, it's just it's just amazing. You know, the the sort of because I grew up listening to the whole Men of Mars, Venus uh, from from uh, I can't even speak properly now. Men of Mars, Women of Venus, but I never actually knew who wrote that. I didn't actually realize that it was a book. It was just something that you know. Oh, funny. I just heard growing up, and it never really occurred to me that I just thought it was you just sort of you know one of those things that your mom just says right or yeah. your your sister just says that like you just hear it and you grow up with it and you hear it but you you never really think about it but then again right. I, can, I can get away and say I'm 21 <laughs> oh god you, you have your whole life ahead of you that's so exciting <laughs> I'm not really but you know <laughs> I'll just say I am <laughs> there you go um, there you go. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and that's you know, my struggle as an author with this topic is a, it's a soft topic, so it's it's a it's not a hard it's not an easy sell. Mm. And second, I have to convince people that they would want to know about the differences between men and women, as if there would be value to their life. And mm. they already look at relationships, you know, work, you know, they call it working on my relationships. It doesn't have to be work at all. It could be a lot of fun, but you know, it's been coined and drilled into people's head that you have to work on your relationship as if it, you know you're digging your own grave you know and they marriage is always you know they make jokes about it I mean it's, it just doesn't have to be that way at all it's just all a matter of perspective and knowledge mm. Mm. so what is your latest book called again the latest book is called love rules I'm so excited about it it's <laughs> and it's 50 strategies for navigating love and life I'm really big on book titles where the title explains what the book is about. You mm. know, Dan Pointer, rest his soul, um, wrote a book called What Color Is Your Parachute? And it's about publishing. Really? What <laughs> color is your parachute? I'm, I'm supposed to know that that's about publishing. I'm, you know, he sold millions of copies. I don't know what I'm talking about, but it's just a pet peeve of mine being a Virgo. I want to know if you title your book, I want to know what's inside, especially if the title is something that doesn't explain it, at least explain it in the subtitle. So, yeah. 50 strategies for navigating love and life. There's, it's just 50 life tips and love tips, and, and they're a page, page and a half long each one, and a lot of them have a little something, something to do at the end. You know, one of the best ways to get out of a bad mood is to pay a stranger a compliment. It forces <laughs> you to, it, no, it forces you to leave one side of your brain and go to the other side of the brain, and you can do it very quickly. And, you know, you just look at them and think, of, you know, something you like about their appearance is probably the easiest way to go. And say, oh, what beautiful hair you have. And you know what? You don't know when the last time that person got a compliment was. Exactly. That's a, sure. That is that very much. So, true. you know, it's totally reciprocal. You get to move to the other side of your brain where you can think more clearly and be, you know, the, the person who is motivated and, and not the victim. And and then you just made this person's day. I mean, right. I have a whole, I have a thing about my hair. So when I get a compliment on my hair, I'm like oh, just like overjoyed. 
Like really, <laughs> really? Because I'm just such. I have such a complex about my hair. Most people just can't even believe that I do. But you know, it goes back to my childhood. And, well, Janice, you know. the, the the hair on your little screensaver there is, is actually it's bald, but I'm sure your hair is. <laughs> My, oh, my alter ego. <laughs> it, it's actually, I think it's asexual, or it's just a little, a little cut out there. But I'm sure your hair is lovely. <laughs> yeah. I know you have a great sense of humor. Oh, oh you, know, you have to have your sense of humor. You have to have your sense of humor. I mean, you know, that's how you get through life. Exactly. Hey, even in the, being in the funeral business, especially, you have to have a sense of humor. I, oh, I write, definitely. I write for a publication that's for the funeral industry, and the name of it is The Deadbeat. Oh, wow. Um, well, I know. That's what people, people, I tell people that, and they're like, you're kidding. And, but you, you, know, you, just, you just have to have a sense of humor because, you know, it's life. You know, right. we're born, we die. You know, it's just the body. It's not the soul. And at the yeah. end of a long day when you're dead on your feet, you need to laugh. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to hear? You want to hear a funny joke? And this is actually the... It's not a joke. It's a story that the gentleman who wrote um, The Power of Positive Thinking, Dale Carnegie, is that his name? Right. Okay. But wait, you know, this is like before I was born even. Um, mm -hmm. So you know it's old. Um, anyways, he had somebody come up to him one time, some wealthy man, and say, you know, um, you know everything about positive thinking, and I'm really tired of being around all these negative people who complain all the time, and... Um, you know, can you tell me where the positive people are, where I can get away from all these negative, complaining, whiny people? And he said, well, um, it'll cost you. And he said, well, how much? And he said, $5,000, which back then was a lot of money. And he said, $5,000. And he said, well, how bad do you want to get away from these people? And he said, okay, fine. So he writes him a check for $5,000. And Dale Carnegie gives him an address. And so the man takes the address and he drives two and a half hours to this address. And the very last leg of the address is this windy road that is um, very steep and when he finally gets to the top of the hill he realizes that the address is really a cemetery. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. So you know a little reality check for him there. Hmm. Yeah, literally. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean I would have sent him to the house of mirrors but whatever. <laughs> oh no more clown rep. No no more clowns. No more clowns. <laughs> Really, cool. send home the clothes. Yes. But yeah, I mean, you know, people are people, and and I mean, you know, Marianne Williams says in one of her talks, you know, who amongst us hasn't done the thing we're complaining about? True. You know, you know, who amongst us hasn't told a white lie? Who amongst us hasn't been laid? Who amongst us hasn't made a mistake and you know made a bad choice? I mean, and and we get all upset with somebody else, like we're perfect. Position hmm. heals being Instead of you know practicing forgiveness, which you know takes a lifetime to get good at, yeah, for me. Mm. So can you ask what is our that? lovely hostess saying? What is? Oh, yeah, what is she? Just, yeah, I, I miss her. Say. She's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was just going to say. Can you ask her? Because I think she's read your book. What did she think of your book? Oh, she wants me to ask you if you read my book and what you thought of my book. Oh, I did read the book and I I enjoyed it a great deal. It was wonderful. Um. What I loved most about it was just its, you know, simple common sense, and it's, it's, you know, it was, it was full of things that you say, okay, I know that on some level, but when you, you get into the habit of not practicing it or reminding right. yourself, and it's like refreshing. It's like, oh wait. And the best part about the book was, you know, you say to yourself, this is something I can do today. This is something yep. I can do, you know, right now. It's easy and it's simple and. And it really, really does work. Uh, some of the things I put into practice with my own marriage, you know. And I was like, when he gets awesome. home from work, he's going to be so surprised. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, honestly, it's, it's rare to find a book that you can just immediately just begin to do some of the things that the book suggests. Right. You know, and I Which was my goal, that. you know. It, just so workable. It was so workable. I, and I love a self-help book that doesn't involve, you know, getting into a good mental space or doing something to your colon. It just was, <laughs> it's like, I can do this. <laughs> this can happen and today. You don't have to stand on your head while you're reading this chapter. Yeah. 
Are you able that, to tell me an example of something? Um, and oh, just, you know, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Um, so she asked me if you could give an example of something from the book. The, uh, well, it, it kind of piggybacks on, on what you were saying, but uh, in one of the chapters it, it was talk again, I, I, I tend to pay more attention to to I, I tended to pay more attention to things that help with conflict. Mm-hmm. And just understanding that it's not so much about handling conflict, but there were things in your book that um, will help you to avoid conflict, sort of a prophylactic approach. And I thought it was so <laughs> cute. It said, <laughs> one thing you can do is to let the person know, even though they know, let them know how much you love them. Yeah. And you said you could even write, write I love you in chocolate sauce, like on their, their, their pancake or... And I yeah. think that is so amazing. It's so simple, but it's so amazing. And it's not about the response you get. It's not about what happened yesterday or what you want out of it for tomorrow. It's just about that moment. You know, you just let the person know, I love you. And and they realize that that you mean it, that you feel it, and they basically they get in the moment with you. And just, yeah. just take and I love what you said about I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but just that love touch when you when you are physically close to your partner and you tell them you just unprovoked, I love you, and they they see it. But it's also something that's almost tangible. They they almost feel yeah. it. And mm. you said it was so cool that um, in the example you gave, the person literally was was being held in the arms of their partner, and that was just being communicated by touch. I thought that was so awesome. Yeah. Mm. All right, let's turn off the phone. Yeah. So you know, I, I, again, just there were there were many things in the book that just made sense, just on a common sense level. But those little those little raindrops can 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 build a flood of, of positivity. Oh yeah. Relationships. Yeah. I like your yeah. book already. I'm so glad you like it. I did. I, I enjoyed it a lot, and it was it was kind of like a fuzzy robe. It was a it's a book that's easy to just slip into, and at yeah. the end of, I, and I'm a busy person, and I can I can appreciate that. It's yes. Something that I can really appreciate. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things that Men Are From Mars, um, you know, women would buy Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. They'd read it, and they'd practically shove it in their husband's face and go, "You have to read this. <laughs> <laughs> you have to read this." You know. And and men would just you know you tell a man he has to do anything and he'll tell you no I don't you know so they would recoil from it and you know one of the reasons I put the how to for men and for how to for women at the end of each one of the rules in my book was so that you don't have to try and figure out what to do and mm -hmm. and you would not believe even with my book being the color of pink some people call it pink um, you wouldn't believe how many men love my book I get if you if you go to Amazon and you read the reviews you wouldn't believe how many of them are from men. I get really, really good feedback from men, and they love that it tells women what to do, and it, they just love that there's like a roadmap, or that you don't have to try and figure women out. They just—it's amazing if you and just I'm give sure them. They also like a, enjoy being understood. They do. It, they it, really it, do. Well, right. As, as important as it is to to know what to do or to understand, you know, the, the person you're with, it feels really it's validating to be understood. You know, from the perspective of someone who is is basically um, speaking from both sides, so that that's got to be yeah. a plus. Yeah, it is. And you know what else? They've learned really creative ways to use it. I had one single guy. He t he just took the twelve rules, the short version of them, and on a first date, he reads all twelve of them to his first date. And if she doesn't agree, there's no second date. <laughs> Another another married couple went on an 11-day cruise and decided each day they were going to talk about one of the rules in the book. Hmm. That, no, I for, like that idea. Each, I, mean, I mean, one guy, he, he told me, keep, I keep it, I was a really big compliment, because I keep it on my nightstand next to my Bible, and um, I read a little bit from your book in the Bible every single day because I want to be the best husband I can. Oh, that's oh. nice. Oh, I've got, I mean, believe the, the wonderful things men have said to me about my book. I'm just, I'm blown away. I thought I'd get more of that feedback from women, but men It's got to really, be encouraging to you. I mean, that's, that's one. It is, and, you know, for people, women, especially single women out there listening, you know, men are coming around. You know, they've realized that 
women want emotional support and whether or not they want to give it or not, you know, that's the ticket. Mm. And, you know, for thousands and thousands of years, men didn't have to be emotionally supportive because we got that from our circle of friends, yeah. girlfriends. And so we kind of demanded for men to be, I mean, we didn't outright demand it, but, you know, if you can't be emotionally supportive, next. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, that's, so then that's in that way, we're demanding it. And men are saying, I don't even know the definition, let alone how to give you what you want. And I didn't sign up for this either, by the way. You know, I thought my muscles and my money and my, you know, my sperm were good enough, but apparently they're not. So it's like emotional evolution. That's true. Mm -hmm. Emotional okay. evolution. You know, as I'm listening um, to Tara talk about your book, I'm actually thinking of my friend. Um, you know, she kept me up this morning, and I'm sure she's probably going to kill me for saying this, you know, but she's been having men problems, and, you know, he's one of those ones that just seems to be aloof. And, you know, just saying it, I can almost see her mind, you know, the, 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 the her mind, you know, just spinning, thinking of, you know, just going from the things that you said, and I think I'm definitely going to recommend that she read your book. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I do coaching as well. So if she ever wants to, you know, get a little coaching on the tips, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, have fun with this. You know, what I, what I suggest and what I did with the Mars Venus material was I took one at a time, and put it into practice. I tried it on, see how it felt, worked with it. Yeah. And I was, when I was comfortable, I moved to the next one, did the same thing. And when I was comfortable, I moved to the next one. That wasn't in any hurry. And I'll tell you what, the very last one that I tried was the timeouts. When you get in an argument, practice timeouts. Because I thought that that was an excuse for a man to, to skate. Mm. <laughs> and I did. I, I, I was like really, really resistant to practicing that one. But when I realized that when you take a time out and you agree to come back at a particular time and you keep to that, and so I know that I'm still going to be able to be heard, I'm willing to go away. Mm. But only, only if I know I'm going to have a time and you know, a place where I can share what I'm feeling and that. The beauty of taking a time out is you have time to cool off so that when you do say what, you've, what, you're, what you're feeling, you say it with more kindness in your voice and less anger. Yeah. Right. What do you, you know? think about and crazy? It, and it feels crazy. less like abandonment. It really is a time Right. Out. It does feel like abandonment sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you think about crazy, possessive, jealous people then? You know, does, that, does your book cover anything on that? Um, so Tara, she wanted to know if my book covers anything about crazy, jealous people. Um, and, and no, <laughs> um, I, I think that, you know, having had a very bad experience with somebody who is a sociopath, um, I think that there are certain red flags and that you should all just run, you know, let yes. somebody else deal with that person. There's a million yeah. other people in the world. You don't have to be his rescue, you know, exactly. the person who rescues him from his sociopathic or narcissistic behavior. Oh, I'm a big you know, I'm And a you know big what? Big Women deserve so much better than to be treated badly by somebody. So if somebody's not treating you like you deserve to be treated, which is like like you know like Steve Harvey says, you're you're the prize. You're what men live for. Yeah. You, you don't have to be anything but yourself. Exactly. That's all. Your only obligation is to be you. If they don't like you, next. You know. True. Sure. Right. We say that all the time. We don't like a guy next. So you know, I mean, it, it, as best you can, don't take it personally and just be you. Mm-hmm. Well yeah, said. Yeah, I mean... No, that is very, very true. I be me all the time. I don't know if people like it, but... <laughs> it's working out well for you, Jim. Hey, you know, I just got to keep your sense of humor and, and not get too stuffy the older you get, you know? You just have to be... Keep, mm. Stay young and open-minded. Yeah. I think being open-minded is probably the most important thing. And then and making deciding for yourself, you know, how you feel about something instead of letting somebody else's opinion become your your opinion. Yeah. You know, find out for yourself. I tell the young people that all the time. Ask questions. Don't ever stop asking questions. Don't oh, take on other people's thing. opinions right. as your own because, you know, maybe their opinion's really skewed, and maybe their opinion's tainted, and maybe their opinion's wrong, and maybe the opinion isn't congruent with who you are. How will mm. you know if you don't figure out how you feel about that particular topic? Mm. Yeah. That's never know. interesting. I agree. I, can you I'm ask? I'm a fan of that ideology. Um, <laughs> Tara, Lifelong she wants me to ask you something. Hold on, just one second. What do you want me to ask her? Yeah, I was just going to say, can you ask her, um, you know, with everything, there's always a good side and a bad side. What did she not particularly like about your book? Was there any aspect she did not like about your book? So Tara, she said, um, so everything has a good side and a bad side, and she wondered if there was something about my book that you didn't like, 
or something, you know, on that well, in that realm. Right. I wouldn't say didn't like, but I thought that I did think that there was room for, I guess, sort of a like a seg a segue or a bridge approach to situations where men and women don't fall easily into into one category of behavior than you know than another. Right. Um, and since you know, since that's, that is a reality for so many couples, for so many people, I would have liked to have seen that addressed in a more direct way. For example, um, my, you know, my husband, he has a lot of qualities that would be considered, considered feminine. He's very compassionate. He's a good communicator. He's very much in tune with his feelings and um, he's expressive. Whereas I, I'm kind of an alpha male. I'm, I'm very, I, I think sort of like an, in, in straight lines. So I think now, of course, you know, it doesn't take a lot of effort for you as the reader to just sort of reverse the advice, I guess you could say. And you right. know what applies to your situation uh, as a whole. But I think if there, I would have liked to have seen a little more recognition of the fact that people don't always neatly or easily fall into certain patterns of behavior. Um, right. And, and again, like I said, it's, it's just a small problem I had with the book because the advice itself, regardless, is so sound that I think it only takes a mental flip in order to uh, say, okay, well, this fits me or this fits, you know, her or him and this right. doesn't. And the, invi the advice is still solid, 100% solid. So in the end, it's not that that big a deal. I just think that um, by saying, well, he needs, you know, she needs to to hear it more often than maybe you are comfortable or used to saying it. Or, um, but but that you know that very much could be the case for for you know the guy. So um, I just maybe just a small section that sort of spoke to that. Like, don't feel like yeah. you're odd if, if the shoe's on the other foot or there's nothing wrong yeah, I, with you, but overall we find this to be the case. So here's how I'm approaching it, but feel free to, you know, shift it around mentally and still get the most out of the book. Hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I briefly touched on it in the, how to use this book at the very beginning about how some, some men are actually relate more to the feminine characteristics and some women relate more to the male characteristics and so you have the role reversal so but I didn't go into it in very great detail but you know to piggyback what you're saying um, you know as as years have you know gone by since 07 that book came out and now in almost 2000 well, 2016 almost 10 years later so many couples have now they're not in traditional roles you know my oldest son he is the one who's self-employed and his wife is the one who has the 95 and she's the bigger of the breadwinners so when they have children I don't know how they're going to decide who stays home but that's going to be something they'll have to decide and so there's all these gray areas now mm -hmm. where for thousands of years we had our very defined roles right and 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 the other so what's happening even to add to that now and I don't know about in the UK but you know men here are taking on so many feminine qualities and and I I'm like so over the man bun I can't even tell you <laughs> I just I'd like to car carry scissors with me and just be you know people have they what they call it when you when you when you um, bomb somebody's picture you get behind them and do whatever photo bomb, photo bomb thank you I'd, ah. I'd like to be a scissor bomb and get behind them and just cut that little man bun off but um you know and and it's actually I mean, they can men can do whatever they want. It's fine, but but know that when you get massages and you paint your nails and you stay home with children and you pluck your eyebrows and you wear a man bun and um, that you're lowering your 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 testosterone. Quick question: What's a man bun? What's a man bun? A man bun is the little ponytail they wear on the very top of their just behind their crown. And it's, ah. a, it's just it's just a little short. It's not even like a real ponytail. It's just a little bunch of hair that's about two inches long it comes out. Ah. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I and sometimes if it's longer, ever. they wrap it around like a bun, like a little old lady bun. Ah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, they had a thing on. It was on a sitcom, and it was, it was supposed to be a joke where the it was a gay couple, and the husband was staying home with their new baby that they just um, 
adopted, and he came up with this apparatus where, you know how they wear the GoPro camera on their chest and they have the whole little harness for it? Well, he had a harness so that he could put a bottle and mimic breastfeeding to their new baby, which I think is a really good way to screw up your child to have a man breastfeed. <laughs> Go through life. Yeah, my dad breastfed me. He didn't. Bre you didn't. Your dad didn't breastfeed you. Yeah, I'm call. Yeah, that'll go over real well. I mean, he's therapist for life. But you know, we, men, men are so. They're so. T I, when I saw that, I was horrified. As a relationship expert, I was horrified. I'm like, oh my god. I, was I mean, I, I know it was for TV, but holy cow. <laughs> Anyways, um. Because men have taken on all these feminine qualities, and there's nothing wrong with it. They're they're enjoying their pedicures. I you know I go and buy nail salons. There's a man in there. No big deal. But because they're doing that, it's lowering their testosterone and increasing their estrogen, which is causing them to not be able to perform. And then they go out and buy Viagra and Cialis. What they don't tell you on the commercials is it makes your testicles atrophy over time. But, oh, wow. So Janice, are you, uh -huh. are you saying when when you say that it lowers their testosterone, do you mean Figuratively speaking, or chemically? Literally, literally. And when, I, when I, you lower testosterone, you also lower dopamine, and dopamine is the hormone that makes a man want to do something. So let's say you say to your husband, hey, you know, let's go out tonight. We haven't had date night in a long time. And he's like, no, nah, I'm kind of tired. I don't feel like doing anything. You're like, oh, come on. You know, we'll just go to the movies. It won't be a big deal. You just sit there. No, I don't feel like doing anything. And then, you know, half an hour later, his best friend calls and has a flat tire and wants to know if he can come help him. And he's, uh, you know, 45 minutes away, and he jumps off the couch and says, "I'll, I'll be back later. I got to go help so and so with his tire." And you're like, "What? And you just told me how tired you were. We couldn't even go to the movies and have you sit on your butt. That was too much for you to do. And now you're gonna go 40 degrees outside and help somebody change a tire and drive 45 minutes each way. Hmm. How do you, so, how do you, how do you not take that personally? When, when, but when there's a call to action, what happens in a man's body is his body. It produces testosterone, a big huge dose of testosterone, which suddenly gives him energy because there's, now there's a call to action. Now he's needed, and so he gets this, dope, this, this rush of testosterone and dopamine, and, and you take it personally because he didn't want to go out with you when, when it was the call to action that gave him the energy. So I, I think I, I'm not clear on, but it seems to me that, that some of the examples that you gave, like... Um, you know, you know, getting their their hair, or their nails done, or but those seem like externalities. How does that affect our, you know, our actual hormone production? We all have a male and a female side, and by that I don't mean sexually, but but characteristically. So when you're when you're feeding your children, when you're putting them in bed, when you're giving them a bath, when you're trying a new recipe, when you're painting your nails, when you're doing anything that's caretaking, you're on your feminine side. When you're getting your nails done, when you're getting a pedicure, when you're all those those feminine things, you're it, it, you're nurturing your feminine side, and we all have a male and a female side. And when women, what's 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 happened with women is, we've joined the workforce, so now we're over on our male side, and so instead of staying home with children in the home all day long and being on our feminine side and having a husband who is at work all day on his male side coming home. And you have someone on their female side, someone on the male side, and you have a relationship that's in balance. Now you have women going to work; they're on their male side. So the male characteristics are: get the job done, focus, figure out a problem, find a solution, all those things. And that's what we do but, when we're at work. But that's and what so, women do at home. They work. They do all of those things that you just mentioned. They're just doing it in a domestic setting. They're making decisions. But, but it makes a difference. It makes a difference when you're doing it for the almighty dollar versus when you're feeding your children because they're hungry. It's, 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 a, it's a different side of your brain. It's a get the job done versus, versus you know, um, provide the needs of my children or, or you know, making a bed. You know, you're, you're, you're dec it's, a, it's a form of keeping your home in order, which women for their home is, is a metaphor for their insides and their emotions. And... So we keep our home about, in the order that we feel a lot of times. Okay. Well, but what what about situations where men feel you know a sense of love or bonding when they care for their children or care for their homes as well? Well, there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that what happens is because you have a male and a female side, and you have a man who let's say he stays home, he takes care of the children, he does all those things. What happens is he he's out of balance because he hasn't done things to nurture his male side. So if a man is home with the children, or if he, 
or he's more in the feminine role or doing things that are more feminine, if he doesn't do things that are masculine to balance that male-female uh, equation out, he'll be too far over on his female side. And right. if a woman is at work all day and, and solving problems all day and <clears throat> taking kids to carpool and just go, 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 what, if she doesn't do things to nurture her feminine side, she's going to be out of balance. And what happens when you're out of balance is you're not understanding, you're not compassionate, you're not empathetic, you're not appreciative, all those things. And so, you know, a person who's in balance is someone who can say, oh, that's okay, I understand, or, you know, thank you, I, they appreciate someone's efforts, but if you're not getting your own needs met, you can't give what you don't have. Mm. And if you're out of balance, you, you know, there's a good chance you're not getting your needs met. So do you think there's there's room in, 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 that, in that paradigm for, uh, for example, women who do not necessarily feel the need to uh, to be mothers or caretakers or or men. No, there's, but there's other things they can do to nurture their feminine side. You know, they can. I mean, there's a million. And you know, anything that doesn't get the job done, solving a problem, finding a solution, anything that that is for her is nurturing. So it doesn't. You don't have to have children. You don't have to have a home. You know, I mean, combing your hair is nurturing. You know, is, is nurturing your feminine side. So whatever that individual, you know, feels like this yeah, is trying a new recipe. I mean, you know, um, you know, put, planting a flower in the garden, you know, watering your plants. I mean, all those things are are, are caretaking, and and anything caretaking is feminine in nature. Hmm. Mm, you gotta mm. make sure you take care of yourself, obviously, but um, mm -hmm. you know, which leads into a whole other thing of you know, men have different emotional needs than women, and. You know, just kind of the whole differences between men and women just goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Not really on and on and on, but it just you know I tell people we're different in every room in the house. You know we're different sexually, we're different emotionally, we're different. Um, the way we process stress is different. You know how we solve a problem is different. You know we're just very 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 different, and yet we're very very much alike in mm -hmm. many many ways. And mm -hmm. so being able to maybe have a knowledge of the differences and not have them like you know, this is how it has to be all the time, it's either this way or, you know, because the book says so. No. I mean, everybody's different, every situation is different, and, you know, how I feel today at 5 o'clock might not be how I feel tomorrow at 5 o'clock. So, you know, we're different in, in every moment, but having, you know, um, a rule book, so to speak, where you can at least have something to go back and refer to, you know, if we knew how to spell, but we didn't have a dictionary, and we got stuck one day, and we we're like, "How do you spell necessary? Was it two S's or two C's?" Or hmm, if you didn't have right. a dictionary to look it up, and you, you right. know, all you had was your mother or your father or somebody to call and say, "How do you spell necessary again?" Hmm. You know, I mean, how far would you get? But when you have something that you can go back to, and that's why the book was written the way it was written—a very in kind of bulletproof kind of a book, where uh, hmm. or bullets, I mean, where it's very short. You know, if you want to know about arguing, you go read that chapter. It takes you five minutes, and you're done. Mm. And, and and so, but it was written with that intention in mind that people would use it as needed in whatever situation they were in. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. Hi. Every five minutes, I'm just gonna have you tell her I said hello. Oh, she, I can oh, hear she her. Can, she can hear you. Right. Um, she can hear me. I'm yeah. not able to hear. Her. Okay. So, Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. It's definitely been quite um, enlightening. Um, and I think the beauty I like about this show is that you know when you get into a conversation with the guest, uh, we tend to just go on and on and on. And I'm like, whoa! We've we've done so much today. And the little human, she went on to do little things for herself, and then she's come back now. She's like, Mama, you're spending too long. Okay, so <laughs> we're, we're gonna have to go. Well, thank you so much, and it's a really shame you. that. Um, Tara can't really hear me. I'm not really sure what's what's going on with our technology these days. But um, if you can send her my thanks, um, I, I definitely love her coming back on the show, and I, I would be happy for her to come on again anytime she wants. Yes, Tara. So she says she's happy to have you on the show. Come back anytime you want, and she's just really enjoyed this time together. Thank you. Always yeah. a pleasure. Yes. <laughs> it was a pleasure meeting you as well. Okay, now before yeah. we call it a wrap, so if you just remind us, um, Janice, please, what the name of your book is um, and your consultant business and how people can contact you if they would like to get in touch with you? Sure. Um, 
They can go to my web. My website is JaniceHoffman.com. Mm -hmm. J a n i c e h o f f m a n dot com, mm -hmm. and my book is RelationshipRules dot com, and they can purchase it off my website and get an autographed copy, or they can order it for the same price off of Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I have an ebook, and I'm working on an audio book, and. Um, if they're interested in doing any relationship coaching or getting cl some clarity about where they're at in their life in regards to their relationships, um, just contact me through my website and we can set up a time for that. Perfect. Can you ask Tara to do the same as well, please? Yeah, Tara, can you tell everybody where they can find you and um, on the web and how they can get in touch with you? And oh, yeah, sure. Um, I My book is also on Amazon. It's called Beyond Good Manners, How I Raise a Sophisticated Child. And it's available on Amazon.com, of course. And and you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm at O-Tara Tara uh, on Twitter, O-H-T-A-R-A-T-A-R-A. -A -A -A, uh, or email Tara Woods Turner at Yahoo.com. Um, and on Goodreads as well. And, of course, on Facebook. So all the usual platforms. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to mention those as well, but yeah, great. Right, perfect. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, and I will see you next time on the Shagilola Salami Show. Bye now. Great. Have a great day. Enjoy your sunshine. I will indeed. <laughs> bye. Well, okay. Bye. Bye, bye now. Time.